making the, um, the shoe box. Thank you so much for doing the stuff's box or whatever it is. Really after, after this box. So, up next we have my friend Mary Metcalf, who will be talking on outreach for the elementary and middle school level students. So, some background on Larry. Larry recently retired from the Coca Cola company after 30 years of working in uh, research and development. He did most of his work in the development of commercial, commercialization of 100% juice products, juice beverages, carbonated soft drinks, water, milk, tea, coffee products, and beverage packaging. In the past, he developed a successful food and science outreach program for schools in Florida and in Texas. So when Larry moved to Columbia, South Carolina, he started a solar astronomy science outreach program with local schools and libraries. The program has recently grown and he's having a great time. Larry is here to present how he uses solar astronomy to inspire students to study science. So please welcome Larry Metcalf. <laughs> Thank you. Very, very kind. Um, yes, so I, I worked at Coke for 30 years, mostly at Orange Juice, and the uh, Coca Cola Company was very supportive of us doing outreach, even on company time, when we had time at school. So I had a, we had a very successful program in Florida on food science, which is something that people don't know about. I mean, that I was, when I joined, I never even heard of getting a degree in food science. So get a degree in that or package engineering. So it's a lot of fun. When I retired, my wife said, Are you going to keep doing orange juice talks in schools? And I said, No, I, I, am, I don't want to see an orange again. <laughs> so you can only imagine how sticky an orange juice talk is. <laughs> I have to find something new. And I gave a good look at doing nighttime astronomy, which is fascinating, and I've never really done it before. Or, but it's the whole idea of getting kids back to school at night. You know, how enthusiastic. On the other hand, um, the solar astronomy, I went for that coke line and sinker because it's during the day we can tailor it to fit, I can tailor it to fit what the teacher wants to teach, that kind of thing. So it has, I'm just having a blast doing it. Um, it's, it's just been really a lot of fun and uh, I'm going to definitely continue. Purpose in talking today was twofold. One, if there were educators in the group, so then I'd be happy to share what I've learned over the past four years on actually doing it. But secondly, already in this conference, I've just met so many knowledgeable people that have wonderful equipment. And so maybe you would be excited to go, and go to a school or library or something. You can totally borrow all of this to, uh, to accomplish that. All right, this is going to be two handed, so I'll put this down. I think you'll be able to hear me. If not, I'll pick it back up again. Okay, so the solar outreach uh, program that I do, it has one simple purpose, and it's solar astronomy is the tool that we're trying to use, I'm trying to use to drive interest in science, to inspire. It. I don't know how many solar astronomers uh, the world economy can take on, so that's not the obvious. Not the Career thing as much as it just get excited about the science. Put the phone down for a second and let's study science. Let's get curious about the world around us. The beauty of solar astronomy is, Bob said that was the sun, so now I can do it. Everything I do, this is the big hook of the educators. When somebody says, Hey, I know a fourth grade teacher, and can I give them your card? It's like, Yes. And there's one key word to say to them. All the programs are free. They just go to the school, and that has really helped a lot. You can see it, it's it's been growing, and every student gets a pair of glasses, and that's what I count. So, 2015, 16 school year, I gave out about 11,000 more pairs of glasses between the schools and the thing. Keep in mind, I have no job now. This is what I do. It's really a lot of fun. South Carolina. They've gone away from the core curriculum. They teach a spot, they touch on it in first grade, then again in fourth grade, they give it a pretty good hit, and then in 
eighth grade again. So my target is for the eighth grade. And quite frankly, first graders really have a lot of trouble looking for the colors. So I'm sure if you have a first grader, they need to spot. But <laughs> typical first graders don't want to get any Bob and Grandma. So you're a you're <laughs> phenomenal, but a lot of them can. So but fourth grade definitely can use a color scope, and so can eighth. That's the target. Happy to do high school. I've done a number of big sixth grade classes, but sixth grade biology, so it's really not on target. What I offer up to the teachers <coughs> when I look at it is a buffet. The buffet is what you what would you like me to do when I come there? How does this fit in? So what you're teaching. Some uh, astronomy shares that solar systems usually six weeks long. So am I coming in at the end of the unit, the beginning of the unit, that kind of thing? So what would you like me to cover? And we exchange emails and I often get vocabulary lists. We also uh, know tell me what concepts. Sometimes teachers are really big on doing the scale and other times it's eighth graders. And then a number of them that were excited about the spectroscopy. So let's focus on that. Motions of the plants, that sort of thing. Then I've got some equipment, and that's the other book half of the thing. Depending upon what concepts and vocabulary the teacher wants to teach, then that drives what equipment I'm going to show up with. The only reason I put this the equipment list up is I wanted to just talk. I think there's a few important items in here. First of all, the solar glasses, every student gets a pair. You can do this without solar glasses. That, that is my really only ongoing expense. You can have a very successful program going to schools or libraries and not even use solar glasses. Just the telescope. I just find that they're kind of fun. So I wanted to say that. Don't have to. That's not a requirement. That's, that's not a big deal. Next, a white light scope. It's definitely worth mentioning. I, I feel strongly about this. When I do it, I use a four inch refractor, three, four, five, I'm sure it works fine. The key thing there is though, I use the virtual wedge. I don't use film on the front. Kids touch this stuff. I mean, I have fairly I have a C chip now and uh, uh, the heavy you know fairly heavy duty uh, tripod, but it gets bumped. They're fourth graders and, and they're even well behaved. I'm not gonna risk some child accidentally tapping the end of the film, the next kid up is blind, right? That would be tragic. A virtual wedge is only three hundred dollars, three hundred dollars worth of insurance well spent. So this is a virtual wedge, they call them solar wedges, if you're all familiar with those. So it's a partially silver prism that dumps most of the light energy out the back. They will not work with a refractor, a reflector, excuse me. They won't work with a refractor. You have to have a refractor. So just pick up a refractor. And it's more scientific, maybe. Pardon me? It's more scientific as an outsider. They do. And in fact, the one that I use is pictured in the upper right hand corner. I wanted to put both telescopes on the same mountain, so I got one there.
consume the power up, and they can see more. But if you start with too narrow and doing too high a power, they don't know what they're looking at. So with this setup, it's a 102 format um, triplet with a virtual wedge of a 19 millimeter. The full sun is clearly in the ice. You can see it. it's like there we go. So then I have I picked up uh, an L high res uh, spectrograph I put that on the Twilight Mountain, and I actually let the teacher operate that, show her how to keep it pointing to the sun. You know, it's got the little bar and the thing that goes all the way to the little bar will sit up and now I don't know. Okay, there you go. See that little bar there? It'll make the shadow go away. The teacher can do that. And then um, a Barbie doll, some beads, yellow balls, and diffraction readings. I have a cloudy day secret weapon that I'll talk about in a little bit. And I do have a house to pay. Um, and I'll bring that to some schools if I've got an extended period of time. I almost always do it with the monitor. It's just too much. And the kids get a kick out of that monitor. So there we go. Yes? It's coming. Let the discus unfold before you. It doesn't have to be specific. Yes, sir. It's it's L H I R E S. They advertise in um, the Stalin magazine. That's right. It's really amazing. All the lines. It's just awesome. So he and on the sodium double magnesium triplet. That kind of thing. It's it's more eighth grade, fourth grade. I do. I'm completely self funded And it's it's just what I I, I got to decide it's just really good over the years. I'm very grateful for the job I had. I actually had a ball. This is the least I can do. I think it's just awesome. The big factors, of course, in doing this are the teachers and the weather. So once you get dialed in with the teacher, then you have to, of course, deal with the weather. And so a lot of times we'll schedule rain dates and so on. I don't know if you've ever used this or if you have a reason to use it, but SunCalc.net. It's this Ukrainian guy, and he's got the rise and the set of the sun, and he puts, you can overlay it on the Google Maps. It's all that SunCalc.net. So what I do is, this is Gilbert, the high school in Gilbert, elementary school in Gilbert on the 18th of February, and I just, I don't have to ask the teacher, where should I set up? I just go in, plug in the address, and it gives me a name like this. So you can see this yellow line over here is sunrise. This is about midday, and this is sunset. So that allows me to say, okay, if I go to this parking lot over here, the trees are way over here by the sun behind, no trees in the way here. So I'm all the way to the school building. Whereas if I said go to the southwest parking lot, I'd be handcuffed by these trees early in the morning. So what I'll do is I'll just make a snap the, an image of the, bit, the of the screen, send it to the teacher and say, it looks like this parking lot would be good. She so goes, oh, excellent. I'll put some company words over this spot. Suncalc.net, very handy, especially if you're planning, uh, because you know, the moon is going to rise just about like this, right? So let's say you're going to go out and want to do some imaging and didn't know if your favorite park would be a good place. You can pull this up as well and take a look at the rise and set lines, and that will give you all the same effort and not to go as a work. Guys, very clever, I love it. Okay, what I'd like to do now is kind of take you through, not the whole program, because it usually I spend about 45 minutes, and then five minutes for a class, that's your typical 50 minute school class. It might be 42 with five minutes passing. But I'm just gonna kind of summarize and run through some of the steps. Okay, get that in mind. So do we go in here and do it set up first, you know, half hour or half hour first, yeah. Yep. So what I did, you're exactly right. That's a good lead. So I show up at the school. By the way, I always pick a parking lot. I don't want to, that's a point. I'm not carrying all this stuff. You know, find this parking lot, put 
it's all the perfect. I set everything up, I make sure it's <coughs> actually step number one is you go check in at the school, they scan your driver's license you can get a badge. Because an old man showing up in an elementary school with a man, yeah. you know, to draw the attention of what we call the SRO, which is the school resource officer, which is a fancy way of saying a policeman with a gun. What no, so I I've never actually made that mistake, I always go straight to the office. So you get everything all set up, check in with the teacher, and then here come the kids. First thing we do is a quick welcome, my clarity, blah, 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 and, and off we go, and what we're going to try to accomplish. Then we do safety. And I'm going to step out here and ask you, because what I do is I have the kids, the kids will stand, the sun is over here, the sun is in my eyes. So the kids are lined up so that they don't have the sun in their eyes, they're looking at me, and I insist on seeing Every one of their faces. There can be no pushing around in this part. Everybody's eyes, and I'll actually say, I didn't see your eyes. Okay, mom said, never look at the sun. And mom was exactly correct. You should never look at the sun. But today, we're going to look at the sun safely. You see the telescopes behind me. They look like regular telescopes. How many people have a telescope? It's a regular right. Your telescopes are not like that. This goes on, and I'm very clear and firm. Do not the ultimate thing is do not try this at home. So everybody's standing in a circle, and I'm looking into the sun, the other backs of the sun. Then I got some solar glasses. So here come the solar glasses. We joke around about making uh, making them into little glasses. And big Lord, you're in fourth grade. I hope I don't have to help you. Glasses. And once you get the glasses on, put them on your face, and then just turn around. So, and that's what they do. Now, they're very excited. I cannot tell you how wound up these kids get when they first put on solar glasses. It's just a den of noise, and they're pushing, they're hearing like, oh, what are you doing? So I give them like 30 seconds to a minute to enjoy that. During that time, I actually walk around so that now I have my back to the side because they're all looking that way. Got it? They're all, all right. they've all turned around looking that way, so I'm staying from there to back wall now. And then we um, are ready to go with our solar glasses. Prior to that, um, we've also talked, and I, I, I'm just kind of summarizing some of this, prior to that, we've talked about the Q&A, so tell me what you know about the sun, let's talk about it, and depending upon what words they throw out, then I key on that, and I make sure I bring up their vocabulary. Okay, so you end up, it's a great time, I tell the teacher to stay with me, and as I walk around, the teacher will stay with me with the camera and phone ready, and then I'll have all the kids be looking at the sun, sometimes they point the sun, it's a great class picture. It ends up in lots of little school newspapers, posted on their websites. It's fun, and you know, the kids are kind of getting something about this. What is a couple, there's a couple things that can happen. And I love the prop for it, they don't say it, but it's amazing the number of times they will say it looks like the moon. And if they, if they don't key on it, then I'll prop them. What else does it look like? That's a key thing. So Talk about size, relative size, and some huge and small, and close to front, good stuff there. And then the other thing that I found is so they're all there, and I say, okay, and a lot of people look for a little bit of full glasses on. Say, all right, let's all do an experiment together. Put the glasses back on. Now I need everybody to take a deep breath and let it go. And what we're doing is we're calling now, and I need to let your eyes go. Listen to my voice for about one minute, and we're going to see what you can see. And it is amazing. Fourth grader eyes, eighth grader eyes are so sharp that they will pick up sunspots. They'll absolutely can see sunspots that my old eyes will not see. A lot of times the teachers will see. But the key is not this quick on off thing. I didn't see anything. You actually have to relax your eyes. It's no different than really going outside at night. You've got to let your eye relax and open up. So 
like going into a dark room. I give that a, a 30 seconds to a minute, depending on how smart they are. So that's a, just a little tip that I learned, and I do that in conversation exercise. It's funny. Even some mockery kids we kind of get into that. It's like, okay, wait, everybody think of another deep breath. And then all of a sudden, and, and I ask you not to say it. If you see, it look like a pepper sprinkled on the sun. If you see black spots, just quietly raise your hand. And all of a sudden, all hands are gone. Then they'll, sometimes we have a draw where they saw it, you know, the right. So they're there. Um, then we go to the telescopes. We form a line, and the first person steps up, they hit the white line. And when they're done with that, they step around behind me and they look in the hydrogen alpha and then they go off to do the spectrogram. Or I give them those little refraction ratings. Look at anything but the sun, any shiny object, and they'll see the uh, they can see the, the spectrum from, from the sun there. And then we uh, when we talk about the we have a discussion on all those. I don't need to go that through that for you. I can talk about problems in terms of flares and stuff. Them. Because everybody thinks those little things sticking out are flares and they're not. So learn that. It's cool. And uh, we go on from there. And then it just depends on the time that we have. Then what we do is we just decide uh, where we're going to go from there. And I just want to. Okay. One of the things that is extraordinarily is that they be successful. And some are too cool. They'll look in and go, I saw it. Yeah, I saw it. And it's like, no, I, I know you didn't see it because I could tell by your expression that you actually saw it. So quietly, I say to them, let's try again. So again, I just want to see something. And I ask them, do you see white, black, or green? If they're seeing green, then their eyes not lined up with the eyepiece, they're seeing the reflective coat. Rather than say, tell me what you see, I ask, do you see white, black, or green? I can't. I probably say that 200 times in a day. You see white, black, or green? I see white. My response would be, that is the sun. You go, why do you see that one? Oh my God, that's the sun. It is the sun. So I think it's very important to stand by the eyepiece when they're looking initially because I've seen. People do it where maybe they did, and I'm not sure that 100% of those kids are actually seeing it. I keep the rotational piece loose, and I find that I see green. It's like, hang on, twist the thing a little bit. Oh, I see black. There you go. If they see black, that just means their eyes not lined up right. Once you get the hang of it, you can actually see the image coming up, and you can see it hitting them on their eye. Eyebrows, like, okay, your head's too high now. So, like, that one, you can literally see the little white thing inside coming through. So, it's just a lot of fun, but I think success, successful viewing is uh, very important. I say 25 minutes for that because I allow one minute per student. If the line happens to be faster, that's fine. If it's fourth graders and they're having trouble viewing, then it can take them. All right. Partly cloudy. What we've got going. Peekaboo with the clouds. Then you kind of have to dance. Pass out the glasses. When the sun pops out, we look through the glasses. We'll have a line form and we'll talk about other things. Or sometimes we do the scale of the uh, solar system. So, and I'm going to talk about that on my next slide. The other thing that I find that's interesting that will kill a little time without actually us all leaving is to talk about the telescope the mount. So I start off as simple as this. I got to say, I do this at library students. It's amazing how many adults get to figure up on this. It couldn't be more simple. So there are four directions. North, south, east, and west. There is it. And I'll say the sun rises in the and you hear everybody will say the east. And it sets in the, and I start that rhythm going, blank, and it sets in the, blank. Now I go, okay, how about the moon? It rises in the, and I leave a blank, and I, 
even with adults, I'll get five or six different answers. There's only four choices, and I don't want to lie. But, and it's like, well, no, it rises in the east, and it says, uh, no, I don't know where I <laughs> And then I'll do one more. I'll say, okay, let's pick a planet like Jupiter. Jupiter rises in the big blank. And at that point, a number of people will find it. Up on the go east, and it's like, yeah, and it sets it up, and it's like, okay, and then, but now here's something you know the answer to. Remember, I'm talking fourth graders. Everything seems, from our point of view, everything seems to rise in the east and set in the west from our point of view, except for one star that mariners have used to guide their ships at night for thousands of years. And most kids will say, all of them are stars. At least one child would say that. So that's cool. So we'll talk about that. Yeah, the North Star, it, it's basically pretty much close to the North, and from our point of view, it doesn't appear to move. Everything else moves. Oh, is it moving or are we moving? And we clarify that we're doing most of it. Sure, there is motions in the heavens, but it's us that's moving. How fast are we moving? South Carolina is an easy little map problem. South Carolina, you're moving 856 miles an hour east. Uh, further north, less here, you're moving about 810 miles an hour east. And I point to where it is. Then, a quick talk about the mountain. This mountain that looks so mystical, hard to operate, it's just doing that. So I'll reset it back to pointing at the north. And Somebody will say, I hope, they'll go, how did you point that north at the North Star in broad daylight? Well, I used compass. There we go, I didn't find a Bible compass. Better than the one on my phone that was off. So, all right, so there we go. So anyway, it's a nice little exercise, and I think you will be surprised if you try this in an event, how interested people are in seeing the Way the telescope works and the mount, the mount. Because then I'll put it back and I'll say, okay, go find the sun, and it goes over and like I get it. it it's, it's not magical, it's simple, right? It's just very simple. Okay. So we have any questions on that? Alright, here we go. This will this will unfold why the part of Alright, what I do is I start off my talk. And it, I don't know, I'm open to suggestions, but I've been doing this for a while. The kids seem to remember. Do you know what a scale model is? Scale model. Some do, some don't. So, but what I've got is one of the most famous or infamous scale models of the Which, and of course, if you knew this isn't Barbie, it's actually Elsa. I could not find Barbie. Elsa. <laughs> Right. Just let it go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're working together on this, aren't we? <laughs> never bothered me anyway. So, um, so, I bring out Elsa or Barbie. They are a, a doll that they are six to one. One inch on the doll is six inches in real life. And the scale of all this one to six. So then I just stand, go to it, and everybody's like, oh, okay. And so, so if Elsa were really a human, she would be in one, two, three, four, five, six. Elsa would be slightly smaller than me, but a little bit bigger than Johnny standing here. And that's, this is a scale model, probably one of the most famous 